Welcome on Cafe Released. Third time is the charm. We had some technical issues. I'm checking my settings on OBS, which is a wonderful software, but it's a lot of work when you, you're doing everything. I'm organizing the panel, I'm hosting the panel, I'm taking care of the technical bits. Anyway, today I've got someone who is not a stranger, but someone I recorded a couple of times with. Someone who I even made live events with uh, D&D for mental health uh, back when we could have uh, physical events. That, that's some, that doesn't sound right, physical events, in-person events. Uh, Rupert, hello. Hey, Kellum, thanks for having me. Um, as you said, third time's a charm. I feel like I've rehearsed this quite a bit now. So. Oh, yeah, you have no excuse to uh, screw this up. No, I, I, I can't mess this up now. So, okay, my name is Rupert Grayling. I run the Goblin's Chest. Um, we do role play workshops for children. Um, again, because not very many places do, um, it is a complicated thing to do safely. Um, but our focus is predominantly on kids that have um, traumatic backgrounds or children that have communication difficulties, uh, children who are um who have a hard time in quote unquote normal society getting their ideas and their messages across and this gives them an area to practice and you know these very complicated social interactions for grown-ups to do and for kids it's even more complicated so it just gives them a bit more um space to explore different ideas and things in the safe environment that's what that's what i do <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. So this spin-off cafeteries was sort of born out of the first lockdowns. We have two ice-breaking questions in relation to being under lockdown. Uh, first of all, what is your routine like uh, at the moment in the new normal? Um, well, I mean, as you can imagine, someone who facilitates role-play workshops with kids, uh, you would normally be in a room with them and um, that close proximity adds a lot to a, a storytelling or a communal storytelling environment. Um, it hasn't changed very much. Um, obviously, most things are on Zoom now, we're using you know, online applications. Um, but um, I actually had this conversation with one of the, the parents one of the, kids the other day. There, there is a major, major difference with regards to, I mean, you don't take, you take for granted picking up a set of dice and rolling some dice. There's something very, very, um, it's tactile in the first place, but it's very present. You're very present in the moment when you pick up the dice and roll dice, especially when you've got people around you paying attention to what you're doing. To click a button, it, there's an element that's just completely removed from the, the process and the experience that I think is now, after, the, after months and months and months of doing it online, you realize how how important those shared activities are um, around the table. So it's um, for the most part we do all our on our all our um, workshops online and they're going ahead beautifully. Um, very very few kids don't continue with it. Um, I it's it's a very blasé thing to say, but I don't know very many people that have tried it that haven't enjoyed it and. Um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful tool for kids to explore them, their own ideas, ideas that you can put in front of them. Um, it's a really, really wonderful healing tool in a lot of ways. But, you know, um, to go to your question, hasn't changed very much, but enough that you notice. And did you pick up any new interest, <laughs> hobby or skills? Is that your new skill to, to run those workshops online? Did you learn things uh, lately uh, through that? Um, you know, Callum, um, for the most part, I'd, I'd have to say no. It's fine. I, I mean, just... I had people who started yeah. gardening. No, so no, no, of course. Some people, their no, life didn't change um, at all. I, um, I have enough hobbies. I, I don't, I, my hobby is I collect hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I already don't have time for the ones I've got, so I, I couldn't pick up any more. But um, no, uh, for the most part, storytelling is storytelling specifically with the role playing stuff. Um, but um, with personal stuff, just, I mean, I do a lot of things. I book, bind books and I make things and I 
paint and I do props. I'm in my, my wife's studio at the moment and just paintings and palettes all over the wall. So I had to get out of the, the workshop. So we've got a bit more of a clean environment to sit with you. Um, but no, nothing, nothing really has changed for me. So people could register right now their children to one of your, your workshops or does that work? They go to your website. What What's on offer? It, do, do you have a, a schedule or is it uh, something which, well, you, you sign up and you organize when it's taking place? I mean, is it happening at set times or set dates or how does that work? Right. Okay. So um, the important thing is obviously that the children are within groups that are suitable for their age groups. So this is the, the main, um, I wouldn't say challenge, but that's the, that's one of the most important things we do. We don't want to put eight year olds with 14 year olds. The age difference is just too vast. So we try and keep it within two years of, of each other. Um, you basically just get hold of me via email or on Twitter or whatever message system you, you link up with and um, just express your interest. And then what I'll do is I'll find a group that is suitable for the age. Um, at a time that's manageable for the parents, because this is the other thing. Um, we try and do these things after school um, because that's the time that we've got available to us. Now, specifically with lockdown possibly happening again on Thursday, um, the, the first set, you know, from a mental health point of view, kids struggled, some, some kids struggled, not all kids struggled, um, depending on how their parents dealt with the, you know, going to the park, etc. Um, so it's it's finding a, a time and a space in the weekly routine that is consistent because the last thing you want to do is have variable hours and variable type days and variable times. It, you lose that continuity and that's a very important thing, especially with everything happening. Days just melt into one thing. So if you've got a day and a time every week, that's a very important thing to have. It just helps from your own internal workings of your mind just to, this is the day that this is happening. This is a constant that I can sort of fix myself to. Um, so we'll get a group of kids, never more than four. We don't do groups larger than that. Um, and for obvious reasons, I mean, if you're running a normal role playing group, you don't want too many people shouting at the same time. Now, that's very different with kids because they end up shouting anyway. But this gives every kid a chance to be the hero. Um, you've got some shining time there. And, and I think four is a good number for that. And that, that, that is across every permutation of, of ability level or um, cognitive ability, any aspect there, four kids, that's a nice number to go. You don't want to go less, you don't want to go more because you be need honest. four kids to kill a monster. I'm really growing to with the idea that <clears throat> four is the magic number. Uh, I three is fine. Five, it's it's too much. Even with adults, uh, I uh, I play a lot with the gauntlet, and they, they pretty much. I'm not sure if it's enforced, but there's sort of a common agreement with all the game masters there that it's four players maximum, and uh, even four sometimes it's. It's difficult passing on the spotlight in a in a meaningful manner. I find when you're three, it it happens much more organically. And it does. E even yeah. in person, um, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, lately I was like, oh, I'd like to play again with London RPG Community, which is a great club, and they got the people should go check them out. They they offer a lot of games online, but a lot of their games got six players, and. I'm, Kind of do that. I'm not waiting around for my turn in a in a fight uh, for, for uh, with five and other and players. And especially if it's only a two hour game, I mean, there's only so much that can be done. Um, having said that, however, I mean, it depends on the format that you're using. If you're using a traditional role playing format where you've got a story that you're driving in a particular kind of way, four is a great number. I recently ran a session um, for a wonderful charity in London called Body and Soul. Um, they work exclusively with children, and we did a session with 12 kids. So it was role play adjacent, and there were role play aspects, but um, I had to make up an entire different way of, of running a group with 12 children. Um, and it worked quite well. We came up with a nice idea. Um, it's, a, it's a trope, 
but are worked into a storyline. So basically there were three, three goblins in the trench coat. So three kids played one character and then they rotated between mouth, hands and feet. So they all have <laughs> different functions within a scene. Um, and, and it worked quite well. Um, they, there was engagement and these are some great kids. They, they all played well together and we were there for maybe two hours. Um, they got all the bits and pieces their village needed and they got home in time and they built the scarecrow. So it was great. <laughs> Sounds great. So it, it just depends on, yeah, it just depends what you, what your goal is. Um, if you're motivated enough, you'll make anything work. But four, like you say, is a, is a magic number. Uh, do you keep an eye on the, the different systems out there? Because I've seen, I think it started, well, probably longer than that, but I really started noticing that uh, four or five years ago, system built specifically for children. Uh, the one which comes to mind is No Thank You Evil, for instance. Uh, do you keep an eye on the different systems which are being developed out there? Uh, do you have your favorites? Do you, are there things which surprise you in terms of, of ideas or applications? Well, the first thing I'd say is I find it great that there's so many people building systems out there for kids, um, especially if it's a, it's a set that they can transfer over to other things at some point. Um, myself, I, ha I, don't, I don't use anything um, commercially available. Uh, I basically create each workshop for the kids involved because, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll use an example, and, um, and this is not meant to cause... If I say anything offensive, it's not meant that way. Um, when people say autistic spectrum, they very often think of it as a line from one to 10. And, and that's unfortunately not how it works. It's, it's more like a shotgun blast and then there's all these points all over the place. So to create something for number four, it, it doesn't work because there is no number four. There's Z, X, Alpha, Zeta, Beta, three, nine, and seven. There's no clear linear sort of gradient of, of, that, of that condition. condition. Um, so to do that, I think is not dangerous, but it doesn't best serve the person that you're trying to encourage to communicate and, and think of new ideas and, and approach things in interesting ways or, or new ways. Um, so what I try and do is I, I, use, um, I use the base idea of a fantasy system. It's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a trope enough thing and it's in many people's imaginations, very dragons and unicorns and goblins and fairies and things. Um, and then I'll try and adjust the rule set, the way that we tell the story, the way that we interact. I'll try and adjust that all for the group that I'm working with. Um, now, most of the time the kids are of a similar sort of mindset or ability level, and I can build it loosely around them. Um, so yeah, that's basically what I do. I mean, I know it sounds perhaps overly complicated, but um, I think it works for what well, I do. I guess the, the way to sum it up is that you not only tailor uh, an adventure or have uh, a kid develop a character which is their character, but you, you tailor the door the whole premise, the, the whole system, the whole <coughs> function to what the need. I assume some kid might need help with math or is interested in math for reasons. So you, you would insist more on, on that aspect, the, the ability scores or the dice roll, why another would be interested in something else. So you really curate that experience to exactly. the um, child and the, you the take other care very of. important thing, sorry, can I, uh, the other important thing is when, when I do these things, I work with the professionals involved with the children. And any triggering events, any factors that they are struggling with, like you say, if they enjoy math, you add stuff like that in. But if there are things that they're struggling with, I mean, bullying or discrimination or whatever it might be, these are things that you can put in a, in a role-playing game. And you, you'll know this. You don't put them in, the, in a way that they're directly confrontational to the child. The child's really confronted with it in their daily life. To say, you, Johnny, how do you feel about X, Y, Z? You put it in the scene. You say, you come across this. You can interact with that in any way you want. And you see what the, what the kids do. They, they, they've got a, it's like many talking th therapies, the people to, to get 
to get any results in any therapies, you have to want to get results. You have to want to be there. You have to want to try. And it's the same thing. Telling the child, this is what you need to be focusing on. If you've ever worked with children, you know that that's not necessarily going to work. So you say, you've got an apple and a pear. You can have whichever one you want. And however they approach that situation is up to them. But I do find that over the course of time, and you know, um, ideas of bleed, where the characters, um, the characters' ideas and beliefs and the way that they approach a problem goes transfers to the player and vice versa. These things do over time make an impact on the kids. I mean, I've it's having a child enjoy a session is great. Having a parent call you afterwards and saying, Thank you for uh, this is not me patting my back, by the way. This is anybody running a game like this. Thank you for running this. I can see the difference in my kid. That's that's the part that that makes it really worthwhile. That because I don't know these, I, I've never met these kids before. I don't know. But when someone that does know them sees a difference, that's that's when you know, actually, you know what role-playing games, RPGs, it's done with the with the intent of helping that it does wonderful things. And that's the only reason I'm doing this. Because it's simply not for the money. Um, <clears throat> so it's a <laughs> it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. And I mean, you see teachers here and there pick it up for their schools, and that's great. But what we need to see. And it's, it's so weird because it sounds like I'm pushing an agenda for role playing games. But what we need to see is people that have the the the, the say, the people that, that can say yes or no to program in the school. We need them to start opening their eyes a bit more to what can be. Why am I playing with a pig? What can be done? I, I'm fidget. I, I apologize. I need uh, things. As long as you stop banging the table, it's fine. And one day we'll have to to talk about. What's behind you? Is it? Uh, I mean, the Uber. The it's it's fine that happens, but it's the second time I'm recording with you, and there's a fan running or something in the background. I'm not sure what it is. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Don't worry. I, I think it's that. the computer, to be honest. Oh, it I might be. Well, you really need to clean the fan of that computer because <laughs> I can hear it when I edit. It's quite strong. It's like a ta it's a ta it's a tablet. So the the speaker and the fan are probably you right next to each other in the book. Blow in that thing hard and go there with the Q-tip when it's off. Don't touch it now. Don't touch it. You're gonna break something. <laughs> um. Yeah. So. Uh. Yeah. So I've, I've waffled a little bit there. So yeah, that's more or less what I'm. It made a bit the news uh, a while ago that role-playing games, whatever might come under that umbrella, because I, I think things get very confused quite fast between what's LARPing, what's uh, exercise, what's things used into uh, educational or mental support environments. But uh, yeah, it made the news in, that in Nordic countries, they had school where they extensively used uh, role-playing games. Yeah. Have you heard of not only these experiences, yeah. but attempts to do that here uh, there's in a, the UK? There's a, uh, there's an, um, I think it's in Finland. Uh, the school is, I think it's a boarding school of some variety. But the entire curriculum is based around uh, role play interactions, and you know that's such a fun way to learn. I mean, <laughs> I'd love to have done that when I was a kid. But you know, we grew up in different times, um, and you know, D and D is the devil and all that nonsense. So um, I think the fact that some schools are picking up on this sort of thing, and the fact that they're seeing results is heartening. But again, it's not a it's not a common way of, of educating children. It's not a, I mean, you'll get very traditional educators that go, that, that's not how you learn. You learn by hitting a child with a book, not literally, but you know what I mean? So um, it's, uh, I think there needs to be a bit more um, open-mindedness amongst educators on how education works. So I think there's, there's a lot of, lot of that going on at the moment. People are, are looking at how kids learn and, not everybody learns in the same way. I mean, I know I don't. Um, I'm, I, I don't consider myself in any way um, um, learning disabled or whatever it might be. But you know, I, I, my brain functions in a particular way and I pick up information in a very visual way. I mean, that's part of being a visual artist and that's, that sort of scope of things. 
Um, when I see a page of words, I love reading, but when I see a page of documentation that I have to does that. So if that's an adult, it, it can't be any different. It must be even more difficult for a child who also their brain does not function that way. And there are these other sources and ways of doing things that, that are available. It's just up to the educators to pick up on that and make use of these tools because they're there and they're available. And there are people willing to do it. Um, Stop banging the main that thing table. Is to keep... Oh, sorry, <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, uh, how long have you been doing that? Uh, uh, do you uh, did you do it with children who are young adults now? Have you heard of any of them who picked up uh, quotation mark proper uh, actual role playing game? You know, out of the the shelf sort of things uh, and made it more of um, a hobby as a as a young adult. I I used to work with um, a variety of kids. Uh, within the care system, I used to work as a as an art tutor, um, and I used to work with the therapists involved in the different homes. Uh, so, in a therapeutic way, we'd sit and, and do stuff. And um, for various reasons, some kids do not engage well with art, whether it's developmental, whether it's confidence, whatever it might be. Um, some would, some would. You'd sit down, you'll draw, or you'll sit down, you'll do something else, and join you, and all of a sudden they just start talking. And then they just, they just, they just, everything just comes out. Um, some kids don't. And it was with those kids that I thought, I need some other way to engage with them. Now, this was, this was like, in, I started doing that in 2012. Before that, I'd done other stuff with, um, with regards to storytelling and comic book relation stuff with kids. Working in this capacity, I thought, I need something, I need to find another way to engage with these kids. So I started doing the role-playing um, games with kids. Now, this was on a one-to-one -one basis um, because often with the art stuff, unless you're doing a, like a big group, like the whole house gets involved, there's only four kids and they'll all work together. But due to the nature of the homes, the kids might be at an appointment or at school or whatever it might be. So I would sit with a child and work with a child. And, you know, the results that you get, because kids want to be heard, they want to be listened to, they want to, they want to get what they're, Feeling out, and they might not always have the, you know, the, the lexicon or the. Yeah. With my my son, who's uh, two two years old and a half, uh, I keep thinking about that that big word we've been throwing around in tabletop role playing game for for adults. Uh, it's agency. Uh, interacting with my son, I realize often what my son wants is what a what we've been advocating for at role playing table, which is a form of agency. They they like to. To be in control, to be able to yeah. to push me around the house, get on my back, feel it in in power uh, to some uh, extent. And I mean, this is you you've touched on it beautifully there. Um, so many aspects of children's lives are dictated by their parents, ne by necessity. I mean, you've got to look after them. You've got to make sure that they don't come to some awful end and keep them safe. Um, but along with that comes, and I've got kids myself, um, along with that comes a, a, an element of, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. And the kids, they want to be able to do something. Like that. They want to be heard. They want to, be, they want to tell their own story in their own words. And as a parent, you don't always have the time or patience or capacity at that moment to be able to hear what they're trying to say. Um, I play, um, I, I've got a group and one, one of my kids is in the group, so he's eight. And the stuff that he comes up with, I mean, in a normal day-to-day -day life, I let him off and I'm saying, don't do that, don't do that, that sounds horrible. But in the game, I'm able to sit down and listen to what he wants to do. And because I'm, I'm there in a different capacity, he, he just, he does all these amazing things. And I'm like, I really need to make more time in the real world for him to do these things and, and celebrate his ideas with him in the real world. And that's a, that's a process. But I mean, for parents to get involved with their kids playing role playing games, even as another player, just to see them from a different point of view, not to see them as ah, that kid that, you know, keeps pouring milk on the floor or, or whatever it might be. 
to see them from a, in a different point of view, from a different light, from a relationship point of view, I think it's, it's very important because they are their own people. They're not just, ex, it's not just, it's just not an extension of myself, it's sort of an arm, you know, it's, a, it's an arm with a brain <laughs> um, and their own thoughts. So it's, it's, it's an important thing to realize that the kids, they do want to have their own voice. And what I found with working with kids in, in the care home, so many of their, of their choices are limited and they are under such a microscope. Any action that they take is viewed in a particular way where that is also, it's, it's wrong because a child doing something, not to speak out of it, a child in care that gets upset and throws a mug is viewed very differently to my child who gets upset and throws a mug because of all the connotations attached to that, because of all the other things that may have happened that have got no bearing on the situation, but they are then linked up, oh, he threw that because this, that, the next thing. Not he threw that because he was upset. There are all these other things. So these kids aren't ever listened to in the way that other kids are because if they've got, if they've got the, everybody looks and hears them through a filter. Um, so that's another reason I really wanted to start with them. And then when I saw how well that worked, then I moved over to, um, to the charities that work with um, traumatized children. And there's a lot there that the kids aren't comfortable talking about in these very particular words, but they can talk in analogies and they can behave differently in analogies because it's not them. I'm not saying, um, Callum, how do you feel about this? It's like, oh, you're... Grognark, the barbarian. How does Grognark feel about, you know, the situation? Mm, Grognark or, needs you know, job. Grognark tired of filling applications Grognark. and cover letters. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we'll roll for that later. If you like. uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, that, that's, that's, that's more or less that. So, I don't know what your original question was. I do just tend to talk a lot sometimes, <laughs> so I apologize. Fine, it's uh, what I call a good customer, a bon client, you know, in interviews. You just throw something and I can be here and uh, enjoy my tea. Uh, show you my... could have said hello and I would have just gone for an hour. You know? Interact with people in the chat, which are plenty today. It's awesome. They should feel free to Brilliant. ask questions. But uh, I told them in the chat that I was about to ask you about uh, you're developing a game of your own. So... What is it if, if you're not using a specific system uh, with yeah. all the child you always curate to them? Uh, what are you going to put in your own game and who is it for? Okay, um, so I'm working with an NFO in South Africa. I'm from South Africa. I don't, don't know if you've noticed it's my wacky accent. That's my um, opportunity to plug Dum Dum Die, it's a podcast from uh, a stream from uh, Southern Africa, uh, South Africa. I, I don't know why I keep saying Southern. Uh, South Africa, uh, so go check them out. And they, they got me in touch with some people for some panels. So South Africa, cool. RPG seems to be growing there. It's it's growing in the last couple of years. I'll, I'll say that much. Um, there's been a, when I was there, um, it's going off topic, apologies. Um, I used to work with a friend of mine. We used to do a lot of comic book creation workshops. And we went to San Diego twice on panels for comics for um, for positive good. So we did a, a thing for the orangutans in, um, in Borneo, raising awareness and selling comics based on anyway. So that's how I started there. So from that, um, the resurgence of the or the the buildup of comic books has, I think, very much. Um, when I was growing up, there's one comic on. That was it. They're all over the place. Now. And I think the, the local interest of comics and the, the, the uptake of comics is a, is a legitimate art form in South Africa. Because um, it's not like Europe and it's not like the UK. I mean, growing up with comics in South Africa, that was a, when I was a kid, that's, it's not a thing really. The, the attitude towards comics is, is far, was far, far different to what it is now. And especially what it is in, in Europe and in Belgium and France with the, um, the, the, the publishing houses there, like Dagard and all those guys. There's um, a big tradition of comics, which is they, which is very it's, different it's from phenomenal. US comics. Yeah, I mean, the, the albums that they push out every year, that the volume that they put out is phenomenal. And the store, the quality, anyway. Um, 
so yeah, no, it's, it's going very well. Um, the the game that I'm running, that I'm, that I'm putting together, I'm working with NFO out there um, who work with um, townships. Now, I might use terminology that people will understand. So township is an informal settlement, predominantly made of um, shacks, like tin shacks, um, and the levels of poverty there are, I mean, we talk about poverty in the UK, which is disgusting considering it's a, a first world country. Um, you can only imagine what it might be like there. Um, so the reason I put it together was trauma is trauma, regardless of where you are. Um, if a child suffers trauma here and a child suffers trauma in South Africa, that the effect on the child is the same. The difference here is that there's still a chance that the child might be found at a point in life where you can still affect a positive change on them using very, a, a therapy, like a talking therapy or behavioral stuff, whatever you want to do, the child can still have some benefit. Where in South Africa, um, there is no national health service to speak of. There is no, um, if there are, I'm not aware of them. There are no, you know, bands of therapists and psychotherapists going out into the wild and, and helping children overcome years and years of traumatic experiences one after the other in the most horrific conditions you can think of. So um, the idea that I had was, um, and again, this is going to be why I'm talking about the comics before, um, was based on a, a children's graphic novel that I did in South Africa many years ago. Um, and the story and the theme is based around that. So I'm working with the NFO who works with townships and making townships more um, aesthetically beautiful. So they'll go in and work with the leaders there and they'll, they'll paint the school and they'll put um, big smiling faces and creatures, paint creatures on the walls and all sorts of, they, they make the place an inviting place for children to go and learn it, to, to want to be there. Because sometimes these are the only places where they'll ever come across books or any sort of visually stimulating um, place that, that is friendly to them. Um, so that's, that's who they, that's what they do. So I'll be I'm working with them to create a, um, well, to roll it out essentially. But the role-playing game itself is based on local, can you hear that? A local theme. Um, so I, I know that there's a, 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 a TTRPG that's just come out. I think it's called The Motherlands or Back to the Motherlands or something like that. Um, I forget the exact name, um, but it's also um, like a person of color um, a designed um, role-playing game, uh, though I think because people say, "Oh, Africa, do you know? Do you know Fred?" No, because Africa is a continent, not a not a suburb. Um, and I think for the most part, I think this is predominantly people from a central to northern African heritage. Um, there may be someone, some folks a little further south. Um, not that it should be a major distinction, but it's enough of one. Um, so I'm working predominantly with people in Southern Africa with the sensibilities of um, the cultural difficulties and various other aspects. So for example, um, if we're playing Dungeons and Dragons and you say, I'm a magician, I can do magic. The connotations from a European point of view or even from a, you know, um, and, uh, Western, this sort of part of the, yeah, yeah well, whatever, Anglo this Saxon. point of view, Anglo-Saxon, you know, um, the connotation there is very different because magic's not real, um, to someone in Southern Africa who grows up in a township where in some cases magic is really very real. This is something that's part of your daily life. This is part of your cultural beliefs. This is part of um, the, the, the Sangoma who lives up the road. You know, um, they can do magic. They can do good things and bad things with magic. And it's, while I myself do not prescribe to that manner of thinking, I think in many instances it can be quite harmful, specifically where AIDS is concerned and the number of the traditional remedies to cure people of AIDS are shocking. Um, there, you have to be aware of these things when confronting social problems in South Africa. The other thing was 
for example, um, I'm a rogue. I'm a rogue in D&D. Okay, you sneak around and you break into places and you pick locks and oh, that sounds like a bit of fun. With the level of crime in South Africa, that's a, that's a subject that people be very, very careful glorifying. Because not, I'd say a large percentage of the children would at some point have been uh, perhaps a victim of theft or um, know someone that has or has themselves. And to, to, to make that sound like a cool, fun thing to do would A, be irresponsible and, and dangerous from a larger sort of societal point of view. So the, the rogue idea can't really be included in this at all. You can still have a magic user, but the way and the the way that they get it come about gaining that that ability, you have to be careful on how you deal with that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a role playing game. It's set in a um, an alternate version of of Africa, uh, Southern Africa specifically, I suppose, um, and it's will be populated by cultures and people and races that are not found in the real world. There may be analogies um, with certain of them, um, because um, to say you have a, um, a herder-based society, you could say that anywhere in the world. They, they were herding-based societies in Europe, they were herding-based societies all across the globe. So, but with that close link to um, cultures that are, are still doing that sort of thing. So there are um, variety of cultures in South Africa who are still very, very proud of their, um, their, their cattle. Cattle is a, a major thing in South Africa. I mean, if you want to get married in a very traditional way, you've got to pay Lebola, and that's, that's lots of cows and, and goats and stuff if you want to buy your wife, <laughs> which is a strange thing to say in, the, in, a, you know, in our society, but it's completely normal there. Um, and these are things you have to keep in mind. Um, so you've got, I've got things that are going to be familiar, but I'm not going to say this is this group of people, this is that group of people, but it's, it's enough that they can feel, specifically children, can feel vaguely comfortable within the, the realm of the, of the world that they're playing in. So um, yeah, it's a fantasy role-playing game with as few conscious Eurocentricities as possible. So there are no dragons, there are no centaurs, there are no wyverns and goblins, but there are things that are analogous to things that are found in South Africa that have different names. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be using traditional names because that pins it down to a specific culture and a specific area, and that's not what we're trying to do. The, the idea is to have a game that these kids can feel comfortable playing but the main focus is communication. The main focus is for the person running the game to allow these children to tell their stories within the broader context of the plot. Um, and it's about making it comfortable for them to do that. Um, We've got Chav Hunter 86 in the chat room. He had a question, but before he was also uh, pointing out that apparently there's a really big charity a little bit further north uh, of Africa, in Eastern Africa, in Uganda, called the Butterfly Foundation, who help kids with tabletop role-playing games, and also it houses uh, the kids and help uh, with uh, development in general. Uh, have you ever heard of the Butterfly Foundation? You know, it's it's weird. I haven't because they're just up the road from me. <laughs> No, I've never heard of them, I'm afraid. I mean, Uganda's a long way from South Africa. It is, yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, and this is me not picking on, on the, the commenter. I, it's fantastic that they're doing that. But it's like asking you, Callum, have you heard of uh, this this organization in Utah in America on 2nd Street? That it's very, it's very difficult to say because there's so much space in Africa. There's so many countries. And... I mean, let's put it this way. In South Africa, we have 11 official languages. Okay? So that's South Africa. There are Nigeria has far more languages than South Africa. And you're looking at areas larger than large parts of Europe where there are very, very distinct cultural groups, people that believe vastly different things in a space that is all largely lumped together in a country. 
Um, and that is, that is a, a point that people don't often realize when you say, oh, it's, you know, okay, it's in Uganda. Uganda's got six, 60,000 million people or however many cultures there are. And I'm struggling to deal with the ones in South Africa. I mean, I've got to wrap my head around the 11. So to go, so it would be great if I could get in touch with them. I'd love to get that link from you if you can send it to me. Um, and for the most part, um, there are probably people doing things up there, but based on the, the level of communication between people in, in Africa in general, it's not the infrastructure for the most part isn't focused on kids, sadly to say. It's not focused on helping kids in, in, in situations. There are people doing wonderful work, but I mean, when people are faced with um, how do I survive in a day or is Johnny feeling okay? You know, let's put food in his belly before we worry about his mental health. Um, that's generally, I think, where most people are, are at. Yeah, you're pyramid of needs it doesn't really have space mm. for you to to start to engage yeah. in that type Maslow's, of Maslow's man it's, it's all there yeah yeah but it's at the same time it's tabletop role playing games are interesting in the sense that they got such a big untapped potential on one hand uh again uh next weekend we're going to have a panel at metatopia about uh all the role players, in a way, all the role players outside of the US and why we use English and uh, to communicate with one another and the challenges which I born to that. We've got Pamu uh, from uh, the Philippines. We've got Diogo from Brazil. We've got uh, Alan from the Wagadu Chronicles uh, from Ghana uh, and myself. We discussed that uh, and we discussed how, yeah, th there's a lack of... Uh, resources and difficulties to access tabletop role-playing games but at the same time there's an untapped potential because i find what's fascinating with role-playing games also is so once you got the information and you've got the concept or a book which again i, I realize uh it's, there's nothing simple in uh, having a book especially specifically a specific one when you are in many places uh, around the world but once you got that, uh, you you don't need electricity. You there, there's so many actually. Tabletop role playing games could be even more widely spread than something like video games or television or or cinema even because a bit like I guess like football, uh, for which you just need a ball and then you start kicking it and you're playing football. Tabletop role playing game, you you start telling a story and you have a framework from it for it and uh, and that's it you're playing a, a role playing game so so on one hand i understand why it's not so widespread on the other hand i, I find it Im immensely frustrating because i believe there's a lot of people in a lot of places who who could enjoy and also benefit from that hobby yeah definitely i mean it, it's about making it accessible for people and um as you said the, the major problem is often language um especially with the rural communities and i'm just going to bring it back to um, my thing um, with the amount of languages and cultures that we have only in South Africa to translate it into that many languages is a is a heck of a thing um, so I mean ultimately what I'd like to do is have this translated into at least three or four of the main languages maybe Zulu or Kosa or um, Sutu or whatever it might be and get that out there because you'll find and surprisingly, many of the, the, the people in South Africa speak are, are multilingual. Um, if you raised in a Zulu home, you can more than likely speak three or four of the other languages um, based on the area that you that you that you're raised in. So the idea would be then obviously to have it translated. And then as you're saying, from a from a resource point of view, we take the idea of a of a pair of dice or a set of dice as a common enough thing. Oh, just going to go get some dice or, oh yeah, but even if you just sc scrounge it out of a Monopoly box or something, um, dice there are, I don't know if, if some kids may never have even seen a set of dice before. Um, so finding a, and again, it's not necessary to have a random number generating system in the role playing game. I mean, there are many that don't use them at all, but from a, from a certain psychological point of view, that 
that element of something being out of your control is an important thing as well. Especially when it comes to things that, are, that happen. Things are not, I mean, if something happens to somebody, they often blame themselves. This happened because I did this. And it's, I'd say many, many instances that is not the case. So to have an element where you do not have control of the outcome, you have an impact, but you are not in total control. That is an important thing. To, it's an important lesson to learn, especially in a safe environment. So, to generate random numbers, uh, that was a tricky thing. And what I what I worked on, and I did a lot of <laughs> I did a lot of role, roles um, using bottle caps, sort of normal beer bottle caps, or you know that sort of cap, um, because that's something that you're going to find a lot of. It's free. Um, Ultimately, the kids can customize them. I've said it through my entire life. From a creativity point of view, because of the density, you're going to find so many more creative people in, in a township than you are going to find in St. Martin's College of Art. Purely, if you're just purely looking at a numbers game. So... The capacity to, to make something your own is so also very much part of the, the, the culture where you don't have video games, you don't have the internet. What you have is a bit of wire and then the kids make cars out of them and then they drive the cars around. It's phenomenal to see these are all kids making things with their hands. So for a kid to find five bottle caps that they use to randomly generate a yes or a no, and it's, and I'll be honest with you, and it's designed that way, it's slightly favored in the yes because the bottle cap has a bias into which side it wants to fall. But that's, that's, but that's deliberately built. It's completely random, kids, but they have a better chance because you want them to have fun. They can then generate their own numbers and customize their own bottle caps. But that's something cheap they can stick in their pocket and they can play it anywhere they want. So it's very important to have aspects, things that are available to them that they don't have to rely on someone else to do. And once the kids played a couple of games, and I mean, I find this with a lot of the kids that I work with, you end up then coming off to how did you do this? How did you, where did you get the story? What, how does this work? Because they go on and they run their own games with their own friends. And that's another fantastic thing to, to, to hear about after the fact. I mean, you, you, you run a couple of sessions with the kid and then they keep coming back and then you hear you from their parents, oh, they bought every single book there is and then they're running games with their friends. And it's, it's a wonderful feeling because they're giving that gift of agency to their friends. In a manner of speaking, if you know what I mean, yeah. and it may, it, 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 while you know, a, a grown up can't necessarily, it's the, the starfish analogy. How many star? What what difference does it make? Well, I'm I'm helping this starfish, I'm helping that starfish, but that starfish may help several other starfish as well, and that's also a wonderful sign that that role playing games has an impact on how people think. Um, maybe it's subconscious or unconscious, but it is an idea that gets out there and it's an idea that spreads like a virus. <laughs> yeah, but because at the end, it's that's, a wonderful that's, virus. That, that's what you want to, to see happening. It's not that, uh, I mean, I assume that your, your game or whatever you come up with uh, becomes popular, let it be a setting or a system, but suddenly you got the critical mass of interest that people start making up their own things. Uh, because at the end of the day, you want them to come up with their games and settings and exactly. come up with games which have their own traditions. Because you, I thought it was interesting when you were saying that, okay, a magician is something different in Africa. I think beyond the, the aspects which is about, is it appropriate, is it sensitive, what are the consequences of suggesting certain things, I would imagine the tropes, uh, to give them a, common, a name common, are very different. You know, the expectation, the tropes, the things which happen with uh, a tradition towards magic from different cultures, uh, an adult would not understand. What do you mean um, a magician throws fireball? That's ridiculous. Uh, what a magician does is this thing. And it would be very exciting to see products mm. starting to be created there and then coming uh, our way. Uh, just wanted to yeah. point out that 
Chavander86, uh, very prolific in the chat room, which I love. Uh, he mentions uh, that he knows a person who uh, helps with uh, the yearly charity event for uh, Butterfly, the Butterfly Foundation, and he, he posted a Thursday. Uh, there's a Watch Price Fighter TV uh, on Twitch. Uh, I I try to share it around. I need to check the video and uh, oh, he's put the the link also uh, for for uh, the Butterf Butterfly project. So. I will include that in the the description. I will I'll get in touch with them, mm. make sure it's fine, and then uh, I will include them in the description uh, of the episode. Uh, a bit earlier, Javanter eighty six also had a question uh, coming back to your uh, daily work here in the UK. Uh, he was wondering what troubles uh, have you had with parents thinking you were uh, quotation mark just playing a game with their kids and. Uh, and parents would have thought that uh, it's it might have been doing more harm uh, than than good uh, with their children. Okay, um, I'll be honest with you, I've not had any. Well, I um, guess if they get in touch with you, yeah. they're proactive mm. with the concept already. Yeah, I mean, you, you've either the child has 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 had some interest in it, or they've been referred to by another parent who's already happy with the results. Um, it, it's a, uh, un unfortunately, unfortunately, it's a very almost insular sort of situation where the people that know about it already know about it and the people that don't know about it don't know about it. And the main problem I've had is not any backlash from parents saying, oh, this is, this is the devil's work or anything. Um, the problem is getting to know what it is in the first place. And it's a very, Unless you sit down and talk to someone. I mean, I have a website. It's up there. There's lots of words and blah, 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 blah. But unless you sit down and play the game, you don't know what it's about. I can tell you all day it's about making choices and being with your friends and having agency. And, and at the end of the day, that's going to depend on your personal interpretation of every single word I've just said. But if you sit down and you roll a dice for five minutes and the person running the session is enthusiastic and cares about what they're doing that's gonna that's gonna explain to you exactly what it's about and again it, it does come down to you know it, it, many people have tried dungeons and dragons or any role-playing game I, I use dungeons and dragons as a catch-all because Boo. that was the first system i used <laughs> oh um sorry the, the the hidden lands the hidden land system everybody uses the hidden because that's my system obviously um and they may have they may have um, played a game with some awful people. And they go, this is a rubbish game. All they need is an experience with some, a group of people that care enough about it or care enough about the system and about the players to make it entertaining and worthwhile to do. And that's, that's the thing that I think is the, the key difference in any, anything. The people playing have to want to be there. They have to want to, they have to care about the players that they're, they're playing with. Um, another reason I do it is because there are no people out there really doing it for kids in any meaningful capacity. Um, the, as I said before, the difficulties involved with it, I mean, you've got to get document, you have to make sure that your, um, your DBS is up to date and it's enhanced. You have to have your public liability working with kids and working in a particular way. There's a lot of things involved and it's not always it's not always worthwhile people to do it once or twice. So, I mean, I've I've tried to make this my full time thing. Obviously, you know, to, to limited success, um, but it's about the desire to do good, and it's not always easy. Um, it's not always easy because people often, like you say, you you throw it out and say, "I'm doing this thing," and they go, "Why? Why are you doing that? What's your motivation?" and that's always that's sometimes a difficult thing to explain. I mean, money. I'm doing it because I power. Oh, well, uh, you know, ultimately you do you do have to get paid. I mean, I, oh I yeah, won't lie. A... Um, but but what um, we but do I'll be is with you, not I... what is yeah. what we I do is a... not I... the best strategy to no. get money, and we know uh, it. I no, think. It's not. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I I give away more workshops <laughs> than I than I make money on. I'll be honest with you. Um, it's two minute noodle time, people. That's what I'm going to say. But um, yeah, the, the motivation has to be the right one. And, and I think it hasn't happened in the 
the massive, massive way that I wished it would have happened, but it's getting there. Um, there's, there are people talking about it. There are people, it's much more prevalent in the, in the US, um, but people are getting on board with it here as well. Um, there are some wonderful people that I've spoken to that want to get involved as soon as something's there to get involved with. Um, but again, it's about getting the decision makers to make those decisions. And, um, you know, I've been to so many schools. I've dropped off flyers because I was going to run a, um, a maximum inclusion event for kids that have been excluded from various activities. That was supposed to take place on the 20th of March, days, be, days after the lockdown. And it's still happening to, at some point. I've got all the banners and things downstairs. But the amount of schools that I approached with documentation and, and saying, listen, I've got some spots open for any of the kids that are interested. The people in schools, the, the gatekeepers, they're not, they're not passing these things on. They're not letting people know about these things. And these are things that can help people. Um, so it's very difficult to do good in many instances. But keep going. I'll stop. Let's hope so. Uh, well, on that note, uh, I got my son here because he's got uh, he's not at the nursery because he's the, he's got a diarrhea. That's a life of, of a parent. Oh. Uh, that's me losing my agency because children they want our agency, but uh, they want agency, but they always take agency from us. That's <laughs> something which is quite interesting. <laughs> they are the dungeon masters, yeah. They are. Uh, so it's time for me to wake him up for Miss Nap. Uh, thank you so much, Rupert, for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for having uh, me. Do you yep. want to repeat where people can find us and if there are key dates sure. they should look or key events uh, okay. coming their way? Um, okay. Uh, Thegoblinschests.com, all one word. Um, read a bit about me there. Uh, or you can email me at jointheadventure at thegoblinschests.com. So long thing, which my wife later said to me, it looks like joint head ventures. It's not, not what I meant to say. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, join the adventure at goblinsys.com or joint head ventures at uh, goblinsys.com. Um, there's a little page there about the hidden lands, about the project that I'm doing um, and the mythology behind the, the creatures and, and cultures and races. Oh, that's another thing. Um, there are races, but you don't have to necessarily belong to that racist culture you could be of so the 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 variance of options is very very broad because that's how real world works you don't have to be you know um born and look french to be from france if you know what i mean so um i have no idea what you're talking about because <laughs> I, I, you're from belgium um <laughs> no i'm from london i identify as a uh, yeah that's what Thank i mean you. you're 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 from london and and i'm from earth um yeah so the goblin sister come join the venture give me a call we have workshops running all the way through the week um i recently put up a thing on twitter for for kids that are struggling with mental health over the lockdown period uh, I've got four slots open for kids aged 12 to 14, if anybody's interested in, and this is, this is for free. This one's a free session for kids that, kids in homes whose parents are struggling during lockdown to help them and also make ends meet. So it's a, it's a free service for, sounds for like a, kids. Sounds like a scam. It's like uh, people sending it's drugs at school per, or games a, workshop a, shops. They, they give yeah, you a... Yeah. Uh, I, they, I literally have one somewhere around here. They give us a space marine. They tell you, hey, look, that's how you paint them. Why don't you buy a box It's to now? give them the tools. It's to give them the tools to go and do it themselves. Um, but I, like I say, I, I give away, I do a lot of stuff like that. I mean, we, we've got free workshops going off and, and it's, the problem is it's, it does sound a bit scammy if you say it like that, but it's also, I'm trying to get as many kids as possible um, to try it out. So... Some may loop back for another pre session later on, but it's about getting as many kids to, to have something as possible. Well, anyway, hopefully... thanks so much for having me. Well, it was a pleasure. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined uh, in the chat room. Uh, that was awesome. It, it's great when we record those things to have people live. Uh, maybe some people would have noticed this new thing down there. I added a, a little thing with changes, which encourage people to do something I keep forgetting about. Please, people, follow us on Twitch uh, so we can have affiliate. I don't know what it does, but it looks shiny, so I want one. Uh, to follow us on Twitch. Uh, if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and leave a like, leave a comment. Uh, subscribe to the show on uh, Apple Podcasts or any 
podcast uh, app of your choice, all these things really do help us get noticed. And if I get noticed, I can make people be noticed, uh, like my guest, like the amazing projects uh, of Rupert here. So thank you so much. I also I got seats for my games of Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventory, which Rupert tried. What can you say about this game? Is it okay? Um. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I'm not even just saying it because I'm 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 under contract to feel this. Um, no, it was it was really a good game. I've never played anything like it before in my life, um, and it was a completely different point of view on the role playing. It is still role playing, but it's in sort of a bite sized chunk and very condensed, complex ideas in a very small space your your reasoning why you're doing something why are you why are you hanging on why am i hanging on to this this peg why have i still got this <laughs> because it sparks joy it's, maybe it reminds you of your mother uh, you know but I, that's the thing it's it, but then on the surface that sounds very oh well, this reminds you from my but why it 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 makes you ask more questions than it answers, which is great. I love that. You start stories rather than go through a story and find objects as part of this story. You've got an object and you make up the story around it. Uh, yeah. I need to get you to play, uh, to run a session of uh, Sonia and Conan versus a ninja because I think it's mm -hmm. got something in, similar in the way that it's a, it's a role-playing game, but it's not. Uh, it's not GM-less. It's kind of three game masters and one player. So it's got an interesting dynamic also. And it's it's designed by Guillaume Gentil, who uh, poof, sparked joy a lot uh, for me because he tried my own game, Paris Gondo, The Life-Saving Magic, with his kids who started drawing the objects and so on. So it was uh, absolutely amazing. Oh, well, my son just showed up in the, the room. Uh, so uh, please come uh, join play a session at Academicon or Gorg Meet ish It's online. Uh, it's pretty much free. And I would love to have more players because I want, I, I, if I don't have enough, I won't be able. I will have to cancel you, the sessions. You tell me, tell me when I'll be there. Awesome. So... Goodbye. Thanks, Rupert. Say bye-bye, Soren. Bye-bye. 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 We're tired. Uh -huh. <laughs>